And uh, thank you very much, all of those students who um, entertained, uh, entertained me during the wait minutes and introduced themselves. So we have here people from all around the world, but we had the privilege of meeting one student from, uh, from Giza in Egypt, another one from Athens in Greece, uh, then another one from Toronto, and then one here from Greensboro. And so especially those of you in Europe and Asia, thank, well, I guess Asia already woke up, so for you that's morning. But those of you in Europe and Africa, I know it's a very, very late hour for you. Thank you so much for staying up with us. And even those in the United States and Canada, it's also a late hour. Thank you so much for staying here with us. So we have a very special company here today with us, uh, appropriately called Culturally, so very connected uh, to what we do, Exculture. And uh, so this semester, every single company is participating for the first time. Uh, in the past, we always had several companies that participated multiple times. And we had many companies that were interested in participating again this time. But we decided to completely renew the list of companies. And so um, this time we will have to do start with introduction webinars. So um, uh, this is the first time I meet the company. We did have a couple of conversations by email and phone. But I don't really know much about the company myself. And then obviously for the students, it's a new business. And so uh, here we have Jason Lee, who is the owner and the CEO of the company, right? And then we also have uh, Gordon... Uh, Perchhold, uh, who is a professor uh, in Singapore. He is originally from Canada. And I'm not sure where you are located at this moment. So I see. <laughs> so you are now where? In, in Singapore or? Yeah. Oh, I think, oh, I think you're, you're muted. muted. Yeah. So uh, Gordon is uh, one of the advisory board members for Exculture, one of our professors. And incidentally, will be the host professor for the next year's Exculture Symposium in Singapore. So, okay. uh, so yeah, I suggest that we proceed with, um, uh, with the following schedule. So first, a little presentation or introduction of the company um, by the company CEO. So just whatever you think the students need to know. Uh, meanwhile, students, if you have any questions, you can type them up in Q&A window. And then if you really want to talk to the presenters, just raise your hand, we will see it and we will add you to the um, panel and you will be able to talk. And so we always prefer the interview style, question, answer, but I think it would be appropriate to give you first a little time to, you know, to tell us a little bit about what culturally is, what kind of products and services you offer, maybe a little bit about yourself and the company history, and then we'll move on to the questions. Would that be okay? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, then. Okay. So, um, as Vas said, my name is Jason and I'm the founder of Culturally. Um, Culturally started in 2017 and we are a marketplace for cultural experiences. So, what do we mean by cultural experiences? Um, we don't focus on experiences that are specific to the country that we're in, but we focus on global experiences cultures that can be found in the city that we're in. So we have classes like woodworking, um, we have how to make dim sum, how to do, how to make sushi, basically anything that you can get hands on with and make something that's related to a specific culture. So for example, um, we have a woodworking workshop in Singapore where I made these earrings. So these are sustainable wood cuts that are um, donated by local carpenters in Singapore. So attendees who take any of our workshops, they learn about Singapore's culture, but also the ecosystem around Singapore. And they get to make something that they can bring home with them. So that's very meaningful. And that's something that we prioritize when we shortlist our experiences. Um, in the whole process of shortlisting, we also have a 150 point audit checklist, which I believe I mentioned in the document. Um, part of that checklist has things like how many years of experience the instructor has, um, whether their location is central, um, what kind of visibility they have globally, things like that, or whether they have um, worked with the government for funding or are they a social enterprise. So all these things uh, we take into account when we put them onto our platform. And we also experience them ourselves as uh, team members of Culturally before we onboard them onto the website. So as a marketplace, we are excited. We are B2B, B2C, and then we have our suppliers. Our suppliers, we call them culturally ambassadors because we work hand in hand with them to promote their culture, as well as the culture of the city that we're in. Um, for the consumer side, our audience 
consists of tourists, um, locals, expats, and then for the business side, they consist of businesses, uh, educational institutions like SMU, and corporates or other social enterprises. So interestingly, we just did an event for SMU where Gordon is from. Um, it was a 400 student orientation immersion program in Singapore, where these 400 students were um, delegated into nine hotspots in Singapore, and they did nine experiences in Singapore, which taught them about Singapore's culture, especially the heartland culture and not what tourists usually see, but things like the community centers. Um, they learn about batik painting, which is a part of Indonesian culture that's prevalent in Singapore. They learn prata flipping, which is part of Indian culture, which is also prevalent in Singapore. So we really focus on promoting culture as a whole because our goal is to bridge cultures around the world. Yeah, so um, I think we have about 15 global cultures represented on our platform right now. And uh, I think you guys want me to talk about our marketing strategy as well, right? Well, one question. So there are a few questions here more about the product. So how exactly does it work? Let's say, for example, I'm going to Singapore. And as I understand, you operate in Singapore and China this time, right? So yeah. I'm going to Singapore and I would like to experience Singapore as it is. So not just see the kind of the globalized um, metropolitan stuff, but I also want to experience the local culture. So how would yeah. it work? So is there some website where I buy a ticket for one of those workshops or what, what is the process? And, and what, do you exa what exactly do I get then when I work with culture? Sure, so as I mentioned, we are B2C and B2B. So as a tourist, you would fall under the B2C market segment as a consumer. So very simply, you would just log go on to our website, www.culturally.co. It works like hotels.com or airbnb.com, and it's an internet marketplace. So you can check out all of our experiences on our website, um, and then browse reviews, look at photos, um, look at descriptions, and then very simply just choose the day that you, are, that you wanna do the workshop, the time, and then just click on book. And then you get an email that says you'll get a response in 24 hours. And why, why you get a response in 24 hours is because some of our culturally ambassadors, they don't do this full time. Right. Their full time business may be something else, but they are 90% registered businesses in Singapore. So what I mean to say when they don't do this full time is they could be a mom and pop bakery, for example. We have a, um, or they could be, a bar or they could be a restaurant that specializes in whatever experience we provide at that venue so during the daytime their their main business would be an f and b business so in the event that they have um already a full reservation they wouldn't be able to do the experience and are these group based experiences or is it an individual type of deal so would it be part of a larger group or is it catered specifically to the customer? So on our website, you can filter by private or public workshops. For public workshops, you can go on as an individual. Um, one person is enough. For private workshops, we tier them. So some of our ambassadors um, require a minimum of five people. Some require a minimum of one person. So, so you can filter accordingly. Um, we are building this group tiered pricing feature, which allows larger groups to book at a lower price per pax. Um, if you guys are in countries that have Uber pooling, you'll understand kind of what that means. If you bring more people or if you join a class that's already open for pooling, then your price per pax gets lowered accordingly. Oh. Very interesting. It's actually very cool. I mean, I've, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, this is it's not like a performance in a theater or, or some sort of a show. You, you actually participate in it, right? Yeah, you, we, so that's what we want to uh, focus on. Like, I've gone on so many, I mean, one of the reasons I started culturally is because I love traveling and I've gone on so many holidays where I really wanted to participate hands-on on something, but the only options were walking tours or now they have cycling tours and it's one tour guide explaining what the culture is, what the history is. But a lot of the times you tend to just zone out when someone is just speaking and you're not 
participating and engaging in the experience. So what we, part of the audit checklist that I mentioned is that um, there is a ratio of hands-on participation and actively listening to whoever the instructor is. Mm -hmm. I see there is also a question from Gordon. He says, so how is it different from Airbnb? So uh, would it be similar in some way to the experiences of meeting the, I assume the hosts? Yeah, great and question. Even more important question, so who are your competition then? Yeah, so Airbnb is definitely in the same space as where we are right now. But what, how Airbnb is different is that they focus on hosts as the experience providers, individuals who may or may not have um, three generations or four generations of experience in their family. So when we shortlist our ambassadors, we specifically try to find those that have been in the business for generations. Um, they are also registered businesses, which Airbnb doesn't, uh, doesn't focus on and like I mentioned we are B2C and B2B so for the B2B segment our ambassadors because they're registered businesses because they have done these for so many years they're able to accommodate larger groups of people up to our largest group has been up to 130 people whereas on Airbnb you'll see hosts they can accommodate up to maybe 10 people or 12 people max yeah, um, I guess the other main difference that I should have mentioned, first of all, is that Airbnb does not focus on culture specifically, whereas we focus on culture. Right, Airbnb. right exactly, exactly. Yeah. So who are your customers then normally? Are those tourists or expatriates or, uh, or, or all of the above? Yeah, this is something that could be interesting for the students to know. Um, we haven't tried to target any one part of the consumer segment specifically but in Shanghai or in China where we are in um, we have a lot of tourists and expatriates whereas in Singapore we have a lot of locals so both consumers but both very different consumers and I think the main reason is because in China there's this huge language barrier there's this huge um, barrier into the market of experiences as a foreigner as a tourist you aren't able to get access to these experiences unless you know about the local marketplaces available unless you speak Chinese unless you can pay with Alipay or WeChat pay right. where um, and a lot of the how, how the market is like in China is such that a lot of these businesses they don't have their own websites it's just not in their culture to build their own websites so it's hard to find them on Google or Bing and then the whole VPN problem as well the whole firewall right whereas in Singapore you you find all these experiences on Get Your Guide, on Airbnb. Actually, Airbnb only has one of our experiences so far, the last time I checked last week. Um, you, but you have them on Google. They have their own websites. So it's a very different uh, right. ecosystem. Yeah. Now, I see Gordon still keeps asking about locals versus um, uh, foreigners, but also there is an interesting question from Beverly Jeremiah. So can you describe your client demographics in more detail? Are these younger people, older people, wealthy, uh, just people looking for fun? So what's the kind of typical profile? Great question. Okay, so the typical profile is, are people that are between 20 to 60. So it's very large. <laughs> very, that's it's a very <laughs> large range. But that's because our experiences don't, they're not like specific for a certain group. Everyone I like to practice lifelong learning learning and I think most of the people that go on our site are interested in the same thing so you can be from any age available but you would still be interested in learning about Japanese culture Korean culture um, Chinese culture and the thing that's great about our platform is because we don't confine ourselves to local culture specifically um, Singaporeans in Singapore who may not find it affordable to travel overseas can experience all these cultures in Singapore by people who are from these different countries. So our Japanese tea ceremony experience in Singapore, it's taught by a Japanese lady who was in the hospitality industry for 20 years. Um, our Chinese 
Uh, calligraphy experience is taught by someone, an artist who's been back and forth to China and Singapore multiple times and has spoken at different museums, different events. So you, you have that access to global cultures without having to leave your backyard, which I think is very special. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there is a question from Mark, um, uh, the, the student in Greece. He's asking, so I understand that uh, the clients uh, sort of gain the experience. Uh, how about the businesses? So does your service help them sell more of their own goods? Or uh, I assume he's asking if, then, yeah, if, if it boosts their business. Definitely. So one of our main mandates is to um, preserve heritage, right? So a lot of these businesses that we work with, our ambassadors, they're very small businesses. They're family businesses that have been around for generations. They haven't been, they're not used to marketing on social media, on Facebook, on Google, and they don't trust the system. They don't trust putting money into that. So part of what Culturally does is we put the money in that for them and then they get to enjoy the benefits of it only when there's a sale that goes through. Because how our business model works is that we don't collect a monthly rent, we only collect a commission when we give you an order. Right. So um, our ambassador's feedback for us has been, one of the most popular ones is that more than half of their experiences have come from Culturally. Mm -hmm. And so there are so, several questions, you know, several questions talking about then marketing, marketing promotion. So I assume you have several distinct groups of people that you work with. So you have customers, you have mm -hmm. businesses like Airbnb, and you have the ambassadors and right. even more stakeholders. So how do you communicate with them? How do you advertise to them? How do they learn about you? Okay. Um, I'll do it one by one. Yeah. So for consumers, we do social media marketing and we do paid marketing. Um, our main focus now though is on strategic partnerships. So we work with companies that have uh, already access to either expatriates or tourists. Um, and we partner with them in such a way where we have, uh, where we market each other's products. So for example, Chope, is a Singapore restaurant booking platform that is in, I think, eight countries right now. So they're in China and they're in Singapore. And we partner with them to get access to their large range of consumers in Shanghai and in Beijing. So when you book a restaurant on Chope's platform, you get automatically get uh, credits or points and you can exchange these points for culturally experiences. Mm -hmm. So. A lot of our, that's just one example of how we form strategic partnerships in order to gain access to the consumer market. Um, if you have already an idea of how marketplaces work, you'll know that uh, marketing to consumers is a very terribly expensive affair. So we focused in the beginning strategically on businesses because we as a company, the team members that we're made up of have been in the corporate industry for 30 years. So we have access to corporate companies that we knew um, want, would want our experiences either for employee engagement or for benefits, for team building. And most recently, the product that we're most excited about is the immersion orientation product where new employees who fly into a new country, they need orientation into this new country, whether it's learning about the culture or whether it's learning about cross-cultural communication so that they can better communicate with their team members. So um, personally, my background is also in HR. I've worked in the HR industry. So I knew for a fact that this was, there was a demand for this in the economy. So I guess consumer side, online marketing, paid marketing, strategic partnerships. And then for the B2B side, um, it was, we also do some paid marketing, but a lot of it is through referrals. Um, a lot of our clients come back to us time and time again because they do orientations every month or they do events every quarter. Um, and then I think... For the educational institutions, they have exchange students that come in that want to learn about the culture as well. So we work very closely with New York University. 
University in Shanghai that does that. Um, and then I think faster last question was for the ambassadors. How yeah, do you? Yeah. yeah. So culturally, as a company, we focus on quality over quantity. So our pool of ambassadors right now is about uh, in Singapore. We have about sixty. No, sorry, we have about forty. Forty. And, okay. and everybody is from a different industry or offers a different type of workshop, right? Um. You would only ever see two ambassadors that offer similar workshops, but sorry, are in a similar space but offer different workshops. For example, we have two woodworking um, two woodworking ambassadors in Singapore. One focused on wooden jewelry, and one focused on wooden cutlery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, like chopsticks or bowls or plates, for example. So you would only ever see two that do the same kind of um, experience, but you, there's a different product that comes out from it. Yeah. Um, I will make a note, so I see the questions keep coming from the students. So students, those of you with interest in questions, I'm adding you to the panel, so it would be interesting for us to see you, and I think for you it will be more interesting to ask questions live. So I've added Dalit here, Burkhadin, so if you guys wanna talk, just unmute your microphone and go ahead with your question. Because I think it's more less interesting when I have to read your questions. <laughs> Do you want to go ahead and ask a question? We can hear you, I think. Dalit? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. So what's your question? Yes, tell, us where, I ask you, tell us where you are and then go ahead with your question. I'm sorry, again? Uh, tell us where you are, what country you are in, and then... Uh, I'm uh, from Israel. I live mm -hmm. in Israel. Mm -hmm. Very nice to meet you. And what's your question? Nice to meet you as well. Uh, my uh, question was, since you started your business, how has it been the de uh, development? Yeah, so, Hi, and, and how old is the business too? Mm, so we are two, a bit more than two years old right now. Um, I think one of the key differences that occurred after we started the business is we made the we we jumped between um, focusing on consumers to businesses um, because consumers obviously in the beginning it's very scalable so we did a lot of market research on that and we this we were thinking that we would start with that initially but then like I mentioned um, it's a very expensive business to target consumers especially when there's the Goliath of Airbnb out there or TripAdvisor, et cetera. So we pivoted to focusing on businesses. That's one of the developments that's been made. Um, we came up with the group tiered pricing model, which helped with getting larger groups of consumers onto our platform. Um, Mm, let me think. And so, and you operate again, going back to the geography. So it would be several cities in China, and then Singapore, I guess, considered as one city, even though that's you know basically a country, right? Yeah. Yes, Shanghai yeah. and Beijing and Singapore. Yeah. So uh, maybe I can share a bit about why I started in China. Um, you, you personally, you are in Singapore, right? I am in Singapore currently, but next week I will be in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I travel back and forth between China and Singapore frequently. Mm -hmm. um, so the business started in China because um, I spent 10 years of my life in China. I was born in Singapore, but I moved to Taiwan first when I was six months old, and then Hong Kong when I was three. Um, Beijing when I was six, Singapore when I was nine, Shanghai when I was 12, and then New York when I was 17. So I have all this experience. A lot of, a lot of in China. <laughs> um, And as someone who grew up in China, I knew that the expat community or the foreigner community had little to no access to Chinese cultural experiences. Um, as I mentioned, the language barrier, the barrier to knowing about different marketplaces that exist in China, and that's why we started in China specifically. 
Um, the reason why we also also decided to grow in Singapore is because as a Singaporean, I wanted to know more about my roots in Singapore. Um, Singapore is a multicultural country. It has Indian culture, Malay culture, Chinese culture, Singaporean culture culture, but not everyone knows all these things. Um, Singapore now has built a reputation for being a very modern city that has Marina, by the, Marina Bay Sands, it has Gardens by the Bay, it has all these amazing, cool technology, smart energy, right? But no one really focuses on the culture that exists in Singapore, and I think that's a shame. Mm -hmm. Jason, one thing that I would like to tell you, I, I didn't um, um, share that at the beginning. So in Exculture this semester, we have different uh, demographics as well. So we have about 5,000 students, uh, university students, of which about 1,000 started yesterday. And then the other 4,000 will be joining in um, October the 7th. And then okay. at the same time, we also have a group of, uh, we call them academy track, non-student either kids, kind of pre-college youth, usually 15, 16 year olds, or although some are younger, or non-student adults. And so we have a total of about 50 applicants from 105 countries. And so looking at the participants uh, here, it seems like we actually have more of those young participants, so uh, hungry for knowledge. Uh, so, so if you will see uh, questions from some of those younger participants, that's the academy kids. And so those okay. kids, uh, some of them I met, uh, we had the uh, symposium in Canada a few weeks ago, so we invited, I think there were eight of them there. Some of them, even though they're much younger, so some of them are so good that they literally made my MBA students look bad. So, <laughs> so, but yeah, some of those questions may be coming from the younger population. And I see we have quite a few who have questions here. So Dalita, I assume your question has been um, answered, but uh, Deborah, Nagaraj, uh, Bridget, you guys had very good questions. So if you would like to unmute your microphones and state your questions now, that's a good time. I don't know. Hello. Deborah, go ahead. Tell us where you Hi. are and uh, go ahead with the question. Okay, so I'm Deborah Rubin. I'm an Indian, but I live in Ivory Coast. Okay. Right. So I wanted to know what were the major problems that culturally faced when starting up? Why did you face those and how did you solve those? Thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, sir. Very good question. What were the major problems when we started out? Um, Okay, so one of the main problems was um, obviously reaching the consumer market, like I mentioned, but I think I've talked about that already. So I'm gonna bring up another problem that we faced. So for a marketplace, um, especially a new marketplace, I think one of the problems that um, all of us have in the beginning is getting the right supply getting the right supply um, because these suppliers, there are so many marketplaces out there. Why should they trust you? Why should they trust your platform to bring them to the necessary demand or the demand that they are looking for specifically? So for us in the beginning, um, it was difficult for to sign some suppliers onto our platform because we were new and they had never heard of us before. Um, but something that worked in our favor was that, was my background of working, of living in China and being able to speak the language and being able to connect to them from a cultural point of view. So that's one of the reasons why I, I place my focus on learning about culture and the, and cross-cultural communication because that really helps you in every aspect of your life. Because I had known about Chinese culture, I was able to connect with them better and bring up, um, bring up uh, similarities between commonalities between us and build that relationship between them so that they were they trusted me to take a chance on us as a new platform. And, and, and you're, you are a platform, right? So for your business to operate, you have to have both sides. You have to have the ambassadors and the customers because one side is missing, the other side yeah. has no purpose, right? Yeah. Yes, for sure. Um, but uh, so I just had this conversation with a friend yesterday, actually. Um, 
demand is very important. So if any of you are thinking of doing your own business in the future, the first thing you have to do is do market research on the demand. And that's what we did. For the consumer side, we conducted market surveys across all platforms, uh, across forums, across Facebook. We knew there was a demand for it on the consumer side. On the business side, based on our backgrounds in the corporate industry and also me having studied in international schools or universities with exchange prop exchange programs i knew that there was a demand there as well so in that sense i kind of already had an idea of who our first clients were going to be and i was right because they signed on immediately after we showed that we had the supply mm -hmm. yeah i can imagine that that would be a, yeah. there are several other questions um, about scanning, so i can imagine that that would be a, quite a challenge yeah. Uh, there are a few more questions about geography. So we did establish that you operate primarily in Singapore and in China at this time, but you are open to going into new countries, right? Including Europe, maybe North America. Can you tell more about your kind of geographic plans? Yes. So I think at in right now, because China is doing so well for us, um, in the immediate future, we are planning to expand to more cities in China. But outside of that, we're still in the midst of doing research into what kind of markets we want to be in. Um, however, there are some foundational aspects or themes that we look into, which I think I shared in the client challenge yeah. document. The international barrier to entry should be relatively low. The suppliers should be should know about platforms or feel comfortable working with platforms because certain cities or countries there it might not be that prevalent right now. So they may not feel comfortable working with an internet platform or they're not may not be as um how should I say efficient wireless Wi-Fi happening around. Right. For example, um, ideally, there should be already a basic knowledge of English being spoken in those cities, or at least people feel comfortable interacting with English speaking tourists or English speaking customers or clients. Um, there should be a strong local heritage that the suppliers or the ambassadors are proud and want to show people and share with people because that's that's a very key thing for us right we need ambassadors who are passionate about their right. craft and want to share that craft with other people otherwise um that supply is not there and then even if there's demand there's no supply to meet that demand mm -hmm. so all these things are important for us when we think about where we want to expand to next and sure. Do you yeah. have any countries in mind that you are particularly interested in or believe that it would be a new promising market? Um, as a team, we have discussed this a few times. Um, we're, we're right now more focused on getting our the different cities in China up and running. But personally, I want to expand to Korea because I like Korean culture a lot. And I think that Korea has a lot to offer that hasn't, they haven't been able to because it's not as big of a tourist hotspot as Japan, for example. And tourists, when they go to Korea, they're unsure of what Korean culture is and what Korean heritage is. So as an, as, uh, personally, I want to move to Korea. Yeah. But we do have some participants from Korea this semester. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've oh, great. Added, yeah, I've added a number of students who did ask good questions. Also, Gordon has some very good strategic questions as well. So yeah. whoever wants to go next, just unmute your microphone. Please go ahead. Seneca, do you want to go next? Or Gordon? Or... Seneca. Yeah. Okay, I'll. I'll go, I'll go ahead then. Okay. Um, first of all, I think this is just a, a great opportunity. So uh, yeah, I was excited about it when I came on board. Um, just the, the culture, the website, the technology, um, it has it all. Um, so thanks for coming on board. Um, oh. You know, one of the things is, oh yeah, maybe Korea, um, the students should know that 
you know, it really partially depends on what the students come up with. In sure. terms yeah. of the box. You can't get everywhere. Um, yeah. So clearly you are relying on students to identify what's the best uh, out there and you're gonna have to prioritize. But how do you handle all this? There's a lot of work it seems. How's, what's your organization look mm -hmm. like? Um, what's the main barrier to your growth in terms of capacity to handle it? Uh, how are you gonna manage all this? Those are very good questions and very tough questions to answer. I'm not sure I have some of the answers to those questions. <laughs> Um, so we operate on a very lean team right now. So I think one of the biggest problems that we have at hand is manpower. So which is why I'm really excited about participating in this X culture program. Really excited about all these students who have been kind enough to, or will be kind enough to choose culturally um, as a company that they want to work on. Um, how the company works operationally. Well, in startups, you kind of have to do everything. A lot of people are wearing like multiple hats at one time. Um, we have Ping Ping who heads up sales and development and she has interns under her. I do marketing products and I have interns under me. Um, we have a CTO, Michael who works on the tech side, but we also have developers who are in the Philippines and Africa who work on our product on a part-time basis or on a contractor basis. Um, and so we try to keep everything really lean, which is why, like I said, for consumers, we work with strategic partners because that's really the best way to reach a very wide audience um, immediately, very quickly with lesser effort, still a lot of effort, but lesser effort than what it would have been. Um, um, sorry, what were the other questions? It was basically, so. I, 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 I mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so basically, what is your biggest barrier to uh, expanding to scaling up? Um, and I guess I'm going to add one additional question is you got to worry about people, other people in other countries copying you before you get there. Sure. Um, so how to preempt that. So scale up and, and uh, creating the barrier. Sure. Um, I think the big, the bigger barrier to entry for us is having manpower first, having someone on site who believes in the mission, who believes in what we do. Because what we do is not easy, right? We're not selling something that people are actively searching for. When we did our market research, um, a lot of the responses were that, yes, I would love to do a cultural experience, but I didn't even know that they existed or that where to find them or it's possible to participate in one. So what we're doing is difficult because people are not actively um, searching for it. I think that's one. Um, having someone who believes in the mission and wants to join this difficult journey with us because they believe in bridging cultures, they believe in the importance of spreading cultural awareness, that's something that um, may be difficult in different cities that we've been to. Uh, suppliers who may or may not want to be teaching their craft to tourists as opposed to someone who is in it for the long run, the long term, and not just like a two hour session or a half day session. We've, we've spoken to Qigong instructors who are only interested in students that want to stay with them for like five years or 10 years. They don't want to waste their time with tourists or consumers who just want to try it for half a day. And I think a lot of what we do is being able to educate these people, um, educate these ambassadors to share with them that this is important. What we're doing is important. Um, it's helping to preserve your heritage, preserve your culture, and share that culture with people from all over the world. Because once someone attends something like this, they then share it with other friends. True. And True. they 
they then like write papers about it, write blog articles about it, share with other people why a certain culture is beautiful and should be shared. So one of the students who participated in a seal carving experience with us recently, um, Chinese seal carving, she then went back to do an entire, entire four a month project on it with her history class in university. She wrote papers on it, she designed skills, and she did like an East meets West cultural um, exploration on it. And that just puts the word out there for other people on why seal carving is amazing and beautiful. So I think these are all really great things that we're trying to do, but the path to getting there is going to be longer than if we were a marketplace selling something like um, toilet bowls that right. everyone and everyone's looking for. Right, right. Yeah, and you're doing a very important job too. So, I mean, in this divided world, this kind of cultural exchange, uh, you know, brings people together. So when everybody's building walls, uh, I think, you know, you're building bridges. Uh, yeah. There are a few other people who have questions. Sinika, do you want to go ahead with your question? Um, Hello, my name is Seneca Epps. Um, where, where do you see your company in the next three years, and what are your top priorities? Very good strategic question, yes. Three-year <laughs> plan. <laughs> Thank you, Seneca. Um, and where are you from? Where are you now? I'm in the United States. Oh, okay, great. You happen to be in Greensboro, North Carolina, aren't you? I'm in Charlotte. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, still, yeah, yeah. So close to close yeah, Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's the three-year plan? <laughs> <laughs> well, ideally, we'd be in a lot more cities than we are in currently. Um, I think in three years, we would have a lot more brand presence. We don't have to, people would know about us without us having to explain what culturally is. I think that's one of the big things that we're aiming for. Um, our shift would be more to, I guess we would have by then equal shift, equal focus on both consumer and businesses. Cause right now we focus more on businesses because that has bigger returns for us at the moment, but by the three-year deadline, or even before that, I would like us to have equal focus on both consumers and businesses because I think they're equally important to educate and to teach. Um, Re related hmm. to that, so I see we have a few students here who ask that question, but since it's repetitive, I will ask it on their behalf. So if any of our students wanted to become ambassadors for culturally, or know people who can become ambassadors. What steps should they take uh, to sort of strike a deal with you and represent you or find people who would represent you as ambassadors in their countries? Let's say, for example, Sinika or Rachel, let's say they do have some sort of a woodworking workshop or I don't know, whatever they specialize in. So how would they go about, you know, getting a contract with you or I'm not sure if it's a contract or some other form of document that regulates mm -hmm. the relationships between you and your ambassadors? Mm -hmm. So the onboarding process for a new ambassador is um, involves a few steps. Um, first of all, when there are new ambassadors that are interested, they usually either email us or there's a form that's on our website that they can fill in showing their interest. We've had people show interest on other platforms as well by just DMing us on Instagram. As a tech platform, we are open to all forms of communication. Um, once someone has shown interest in joining our platform, whether it's by email or the form online, we set up a meeting to meet that person and talk about like why they think they're, why they started the business that they are starting, that they're in. Um, what 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 brought on this passion because we want passionate culturally ambassadors right and um and then we explain what culturally is what how we collect a commission etc what our marketing tactics are for example and then we set up a trial workshop with them so what i mean by a trial workshop is it's a complimentary workshop where us as culturally uh, the team members, we get to try the experience that you want to offer on our platform because we need right. to audit the experience. During this experience, we invite um, 
other consumers or other corporate clients who are interested in uh, an oncoming employee engagement activity or family day activity and want to try this new experience. And we use this trial experience also to invite our in-house photographer to take photos, take videos that we can then use for marketing so that our platform has a consistent aesthetic for right. photos um, that are on our website. So we strategically put this all together in such a way such that in one trial experience, we get to try the, the workshop and see whether it should be on our platform. We get to audit the workshop. We get to share this experience with potential clients and we get to collect marketing materials from this experience. That actually sounds very reasonable, yeah. Yeah, and subsequently after this, then um, the ambassador just has to fill in, a, fill in two forms with their workshop details, their banking details, their communication details, and we put it on our website and it's as simple as that. So then would you be open to the idea of the Exculture students either approaching you as potential ambassadors or being the link or sort of like an area or country representatives who would go and recruit potential uh, ambassadors? Is that a sort of something that you would be interested in? Yeah, I think something that we would be open to. Um, it would, would be open to, but it would really depend on which country or city you're in and whether we see ourselves there in the new, near future. Um, for example, for Beijing, which we are launching in the next few months, um, we've been collecting ambassadors there for the past four months, but we strategically waited until we have about 20 or so before we live it on our platform, on our website, because we don't want our consumers to go to a city site and only see a handful of experiences, because I think that defeats the consumer experience. Um, so I think, though, that we would be happy to have, hmm, I think it would be great to have ambassadors who are interested in promoting our mission and maybe conducting one-time events in their cities of living. Um, and I think that would be a good way to kind of gauge the interest or to promote right. the business as a whole. So I think like that's something that I would be open to exploring and discussing with the students who are interested. Yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, Rachel, I saw you had a very good question. Uh, Deborah, I think we answered yours. So if you have any last minute questions, please go ahead now. Oh, um, oh what's this? Rachel, go ahead. We can Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Um, so what partnerships do you have with other businesses other than ambassadors, such as transportation or hospitality or any other industries? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we partner with tourism companies to gain access to tourists that come into the countries that we're in. Um, we partner with educational institutions, like I mentioned, that have exchange students who always want to try cultural experiences when they're in a new country, for example. Um, one of the more I guess unique partnerships we have is with uh, with dating companies. Dating companies. <laughs> yeah, dating companies are always looking for exciting or unique experiences for their speed dating events. Hmm. When new people meet other new people, they want it to not just be, I guess, an awkward conversation over coffee. They want you to be participating in a workshop together, um, preferably something that you have a shared interest in. So we did a series of um, alcoholic experiences recently <laughs> with a company <laughs> that we were. Yeah, there was a cocktail night where our local Singaporean bartender, um, he introduced different Singapore cocktails 
and ingredients that can only be found in Singapore that have been introduced into these drinks. Then there was Whiskey Night, where we talked about the history of whiskey and how to savor different types of whiskey. And then we had Gin Night, which was, um, I believe the gin was from New Zealand. Um, and, but it was very special gin because it was from New Zealand, but there were flavors that were like saffron flavored gin and wasabi flavored gin. Um, which are from India, from um, spices that are from India or spice or flavors that are from Japan, right? But made and packaged purely in New Zealand. So it's a merge of cultures that you experience in cultural experiences or platform or workshops. And in all three events, you get very different um, attendees. People who like whiskey, people who like gin, they're very different. People who like cocktails and beer, they're very different. So this unique partnership we have with um, one of the dating companies is such that every month they will shortlist maybe three to four experiences on that platform and then open it up to singles to connect on a speed dating. Right. Yeah. An another group of customers that come to mind. Yeah, so not confined to any type of Right, right. <laughs> yeah, but I'm thinking also, for example, you know, Exculture. So when we will be organizing the symposium in Singapore, I think it would yeah. be wonderful to add some sort of, you know, local experience for the students. Uh, so, or, for example, all those study abroad, you know, uh, trips, you know, many universities take their students for a week, two weeks. Karen will be taking our students to Germany, right, in the spring, Karen? And so... Again, it, it seems to me it would be, I'm not sure if there's something like this in Germany, but I think that would be a nice addition. Belgium, to yeah, but. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I stepped away for a second just to think about, I did a, a small little, you can't really see it well here, but it is a beautiful lantern from um, Hoi An, Vietnam. And we did this uh, full day experience. We were in someone's home. They taught us to do this craft. We like treasure our, our you know, little um, lanterns that we've made years ago still today. And the only way that we ever knew about this experience was because we stayed at a really small boutique hotel and they let us know about a small entrepreneur that was doing something like this. So um, this makes me think about your organization and how interesting it is and how you can connect in many different ways and promote culture. Um, and so I was thinking, yeah, how would I bring your business into, let's say, tourism or hospitality? That there were some questions in the Q&A about things like that. So your B2B connection, I, I'm really curious to hear about how you plan in the next few years to tap into that market or do you feel like that's, do you, do you want to go in that direction? Um, did you say B2B? For, to, for tourism, for um, connecting to hotels where they're promoting your yes. experiences. Yeah. So one of the other strategic partnerships that we are currently exploring um, or currently in talks with building is um, being part of hospitality or hotel software, which tar targets um, incoming hotel guests or incoming tourists. So culturally these experiences will be added to their list of pre-arrival purchases that they can make before they they check in to the hotel that they're in. Usually, usually pre-arrival um, add-ons are things like uh, an upgrade or chocolate or champagne, for example, if you are going on a honeymoon. But um, culturally experiences will subsequently be added into this list of pre-arrival add-ons. So as a family, as a couple, you will immediately when you before you even arrive in the city, know about culturally experiences and our offerings. Um, and that's definitely something that we want to explore with more and more hotel softwares or even hotels down the line um so i think that's a great question and i'm really glad that that boutique hotel that you stayed in shared that information with you because you're right it's so hard to find these access to these experiences unless there's a platform which is why i found it really necessary to build a platform thank you very much yeah great 
the questions keep coming, but I would like to be respectful of, of everybody's time. So we are pretty much, we usually try to keep these to 45 minutes. And I know that some of the participants are now in Europe, Africa, where it's like 3 a.m. literally. But so here's what I suggest we do. Uh, if students have additional questions, email them to us, and then we will forward them to the company. Normally, yeah. we do not share the company email address directly because it's hundreds of emails sometimes, you know, in a given day, but most of them tend to be repetitive. And so this way, we don't bother, don't want to bother you with the same question over and over again. So my assistant uh, will compile them. And if it's a repetitive question, we have the answer. We'll just copy and paste the answer. And if it's a new one, then we'll reach out to the company. And so this way, we will continue communicating. And then maybe towards the end of the semester, maybe we'll do another webinar. And at that time, the students hopefully will have not only more specific questions, but maybe some ideas they want to run by you and maybe get some feedback before they finalize their proposals. And so hopefully we'll be able to do that again as well, maybe sometime in late October or something like that, or early November. So if that's okay. That sounds great. And then also administratively, not related to the presentation, um, a couple of students asked about the test links. So if you're in the academy track or coaching program, the uh, links to your weekly theory tests went out earlier today. You should have received them within the last few hours. You have until Sunday to complete the test, so you have enough time. Uh, so uh, take your time. And those of you who are university students, the teams were formed yesterday. We will probably place a few more students on teams tomorrow. Again, your next deadline is Thursday. Uh, all you have to do is just tell us if you've been able to communicate with your team members. So at this time, you don't have to do anything else. But then next week, you will have to select your client organization, culturally, or any other org organization we have this time. So you have some time to, to make those decisions. So no all right, well, Jason, thank you so much for your time. And obviously, Karen, Gordon, Gordon, thank you so much for putting us in touch with this wonderful organization. And thank you, Karen, for being here. And all of the students who are here uh, for the presentation and asked wonderful questions. So we'll be in touch then by email and then maybe one more webinar later on in the semester. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. And I, I see that some people were saying thank you on the chat, but for some reason, I'm not able to reply. So I'm just... <laughs> And I acknowledge that and thank you everyone for your thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you everyone. Yes. And the Evan, I see your email, so I'll send you that link again. All right. Okay. Bye bye.